Excellent, excellent. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Cristina. Um, um, thank you uh, also to um, Doña Margaret, um, where, wherever you might be. If you're joining us, that's wonderful. Um, if not, I hope you're enjoying your retirement. Um, it is an incredible honor uh, to be here with you all, to come back, because um, I, I was here uh, during Hispanic Heritage Month with you all last year to share a little bit about the work that I've done, uh, the historical research that I've done um, to understand the roots of the Latinx community here in Oregon. And um, yeah, I want to start first with a land acknowledgement, um, and then we'll jump into our presentation. So if you'll bear with me for one second while I share my screen. Hey, there we go. Excellent. So uh, again, um, my name is Israel Pastrana. My pronouns are he, him, uh, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share this knowledge with you all. Um, but again, uh, it is Native American uh, and Alaska Native Heritage Month. And so it's really important, um, not only then, but always that we start with a land acknowledgement and you all, the county has a really beautiful statement uh, created uh, that I wanna share with you all now. We want to acknowledge the people on whose land we live, the Atfalati Kalapuyans, also known as the Tualatin Band of Kalapuyans, the first inhabitants of Washington County. We are grateful for the land we are on, Kalapuyan land. Signers of the Willamette Valley Treaty in 1855 were removed from their homelands to the Grand Ronde Indian Reservation. Today, their descendants are tribal members of Grand Ronde and Silette's tribes, carrying on the traditions and cultures of their ancestors. We acknowledge and express gratitude for the ancestors of this place and recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their continuation on in our community. Please reflect on the role government has played in the painful colonial history and reflect as well on the resilience and healing of the indigenous land and communities. We would like to invite everyone to collaborate and work together with these tribes to take care of this land and water and the people who inhabit these spaces. And as I understand it, the statement was prepared with representatives of the Confederate tribes of Grand Ronde, the Nez Perce, Siletz, and Yavapai tribes. Anytime I'm entering into a space like this, I think it's really important to start uh, with acknowledging one's positionality, um, what researchers often describe as a positionality statement. And when I think about positionality, I think about all of the different historical forces that have shaped where I am and who I am and, and how I enter into this space. I think about the social, the historical, uh, the economic forces that led uh, my ancestors to migrate uh, that have ultimately led me to be here. Um, I also think about how my identity shapes my relationship to the research topics that I'm interested in. I don't just research Mexican and Latinx communities in Oregon. I'm also a part of these communities. And I think it's important to acknowledge these connections that we share uh, to the work that we do, uh, the research that we engage in, and so on. And so I want to share just a little bit about myself and, and my background as a way of explaining how I enter into this work. The man on the far left is my great grandfather. His name is Victoria, was Victoriano. Victoriano Gomez was born in 1907, which means he would have been a teenager during the Mexican Revolution, a very violent period in Mexican history when historians estimate somewhere in uh, approximately one tenth of Mexico's population migrates uh, to the United States. He does not migrate during the Mexican Revolution, but I do have record of his migration to the United States in the 1940s at a time when Victoriano operated a small cotton farm in the border city of Mexicali. The middle photograph is my grandfather who arrived on Victoriano's farm as a teenager coming from a town called Mascota, Jalisco. He'd been lured by the promise of opportunity in the North parts of Mexico. And so he arrived as a young man on Victoriano's farm seeking work. Uh, he not only found that, he also found love. Uh, and the woman in the photograph there in the middle is my grandmother. 
uh, who was the daughter of Victoriano, and together they eloped. My grandfather uh, was able to sustain his family by engaging in transnational migration, uh, beginning first in 1954 as part of the Bracero program, but continuing on afterwards um, in both undocumented and documented capacities. Later on, uh, his migration also becomes my family's migration. And so the photograph on the top right is uh, of my mother and a uh, family friend. My mother is the one making the very dramatic pose. And they're actually in a migrant camp. Uh, um, housing for migrants um, uh, is, was, is, continues to be very substandard. Uh, and this was a period where my, fam my extended family was engaging in the practice of, of migratory farm work. And that continued until I was about three or four years old. And the photograph on the bottom right uh, is the very last time that my family engages in uh, seasonal migratory labor. Uh, I'm the little boy in the middle. Um, shortly after this photograph was taken, most of the men in my family were able to regulate their status uh, in this country as a result of the Immigration Reform and Control Act. And that allowed them to move into more stable forms of employment, things like construction work, janitorial services, right? Work that uh, created opportunities for stability uh, that really had an important impact on my life uh, and the lives of my cousins. This history uh, is passed down through oral history to through the tradition of, of storytelling, something that my grandfather inculcated in me in a young age, but very little of this history is actually in the official archives that are used to tell the stories, the official histories of a particular place and time. Uh, and so as a historian, um, these are the two of the few documents that I've found uh, which tell any part of this story uh, that I just shared with you all uh, through formal or official means. Uh, and so the photographs on the left-hand side uh, are the border crossing documents of my great-grandfather Victoriano, um, which were issued to him in 1948, um, which is a hundred years after the end of the Mexican-American War, um, something I'll be talking more about a little bit later on. And my great grandfather, Victoriano, would have used this card uh, to cross the border from Mexico into the United States to engage in commercial activity. You can see the slide, the image on the bottom left uh, says that his purpose for coming to the United States was to purchase, that he owned 15 acres of land, uh, that he had three children, one of them being my grandmother, uh, that he lived in Mexicali and had brothers living on the US side of the border. This border crossing card uh, is something that I found while um, doing research at the National Archives. Um, I did not find the document on the right in that location. Uh, instead, this is something that I found in my grandfather's archive. Uh, and it is a copy of his Bracero contract. This is the formal contract that my grandfather signed in 1956 um, to enter the United States as a seasonal migrant worker. Um, and as you can see by the document, he came into the United States in October on October 9th. He stayed for about six weeks, leaving on November 20th, um, and, and did not return as a Bracero. Um, you can see the stamp says his employment was terminated. Uh, seasonal migrant workers contracted under the Bracero program, and I'll talk about the Bracero program in a whole nother session, um, would have had the opportunity to recontract, but my grandfather chose not to. Um, part of that has to do with his experience in the United States and uh, the opportunities that were to, available to him working outside of the legal channels, that is, as an undocumented worker. I think about these documents and I think about my family's history uh, as a way of explaining um, what historians describe as the long fetch. Uh, and I want to share this metaphor with you all as a way of thinking not just about my family's history and maybe your family's history, but also thinking it was a way of thinking about the way that this history shapes the present. It's easy to think about my family's migration uh, as a series of waves, like starting with my great grandfather, Victoriano, followed by Magdaleno, my grandfather, the Bracero, Magdalena, my, grand, my mother, excuse me, and myself. 
And certainly that is a really impactful metaphor to think about these successive waves coming uh, of migrants coming into the United States and bringing with them uh, ethnicity and culture and identity and, and so on and so forth. I think that there's also another way of thinking about this history uh, that instead considers the, not just the repetitiveness of the wave, but also the length of history uh, that produces it. Uh, and so as I reflect on my own space, again, my positionality uh, in relation to this work, I think about my great grandfather, my grandfather and my mother, and how all of this history is part of a, a kind of long fetch uh, that ultimately creates my presence here in Oregon uh, and, and, and contributes, right, to the work that I'm doing here. I'm really cognizant of kind of how I step into this history, and, and I'm aware that I'm not the first academic uh, that is invited into spaces like this uh, to share their historical knowledge. Um, in other words, there is a, a long fetch uh, to the history that I'm doing here, right? To the work that I'm doing here of sharing this history. Uh, and so in the archive of um, Jose Angel Gutierrez, uh, a man who in Crystal City, Texas founded La Raza Unida Party, I found a handful of historical documents uh, that describe uh, these very early efforts to share the basic outlines of Chicano or Hispanic history here in the state of Oregon. These documents are from 1982 and 1983. Um, I was born in 84 to give you a sense of, of time. And so I, I'm in awe that Jose Angel Gutierrez and, and others, maybe in fact, some of you all on this call were involved in, in activist work, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago to help spread awareness about the history and identity of ethnic Mexican and Latin American origin people here in the United States. The document on the left comes from Consuelo Zaragoza, who had a long career, has a long career here in Oregon. Uh, and she is inviting Professor Jose Angel Gutierrez, who was then uh, an instructor at Western Oregon University, to come to her organization, the Marion Learning Center in Woodburn, Woodburn, Oregon, excuse me, to share a presentation on the word Chicano and its origins. Consuelo adds that it would be very valuable and educational for students at the center to learn about the origins of this new word and the emerging identity that many Mexican Americans and ethnic Mexicans were beginning to adopt. The document on the right is a let is a response, excuse me, to a letter written by Jose Angel Gutierrez to a professor at the University of Washington named Erasmo Gamboa. Erasmo was one of the first uh, Chicano historians to study the presence of Mexican people in the Pacific Northwest. And Jose Angel Gutierrez reached out to him asking whether he could share any information on Chicano history in Oregon. And the response, Erasmo Gamboa says, there's really only a handful of publications. He adds, I've just returned from Oregon State University and the University of Oregon Libraries and can report that there is very little. I haven't found much published or unpublished historical studies of Chicanos in Oregon. What this means is that you will have to conduct your own primary research. And so I think about this from a couple of different perspectives. First of all, 1982, these folks are having this conversation about the importance of uh, uh, unearthing Chicano history in Oregon. Uh, and secondly, that there's a dearth of it in 1982, right? That there's very little historical work uh, being done to understand the origins of uh, what's become a very large population of folks uh, here in the state of Oregon. And so um, this learning series in many ways is a continuation of you know, what Jose Angel Gutierrez was being asked to do in 1982 and 1983, which is to share some really basic knowledge about Chicano history, about the history of Mexican-American, ethnic Mexican, uh, uh, and, and other uh, Latin American and Latino people here in, in the state.
So uh, Christina mentioned that this is a five-part learning series, uh, and I want to share briefly with you all an outline of what those five sessions are going to look like. Um, this first session, uh, we're going to talk about the roots and roots of Latinx communities. And, you know, since this is our first session, we're going to do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, foundational work. You know, I talked already about positionality. I shared this idea of, of waves and a long fetch as a kind of metaphor for understanding the history that we're engaging with. I'm going to talk a little bit about the terms that we're using, Hispanic, Chicano, Latino, Latinx, Right? And this foundational work is not going to be present in each one of these sessions, um, but I think it's really important that we start with that. Um, moving on from there, the next session, uh, um, which is, I believe, three months from now, will be about the Bracero program, which I mentioned earlier. My grandfather was one of the 5.5 million Mexican men that come to the United States for seasonal agricultural work under the auspices of the Bracero program. And I want to reflect on the experience of Mexican Americans in wartime, especially here in the Pacific Northwest. Session three uh, focuses on the civil rights period uh, and the emergence of Chicano and Chicana identity, uh, especially here in the Pacific Northwest. And in this third session, I really want to emphasize uh, the, the role that the Black civil rights movement and the Black power movement in particular play uh, in, in shaping uh, so much of the rhetoric around uh, the emergence of a Chicano and Chicana identity. I'll share some of the research that I did as part of a, a guest curatorship uh, that I completed at Five Oaks Museum uh, during that presentation. In session four, I'm going to talk about immigration and transnational politics. I'm going to talk about uh, the 1980s uh, and some changes to immigration law that have a really profound impact for Latinx people in the United States. I mentioned already that IRCA, or the Immigration Reform and Control Act, allowed my family to legalize their immigration status. It also is the beginning of a really profound demographic shift here in Oregon and in the Pacific Northwest. Miguel, I, I saw you raise your hand. Um, I'm happy to make some time for questions. Uh, if folks are, are having questions now, or we also will leave some, some space for questions uh, at the very end as well. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, the last session uh, is, is focused on the contemporary uh, social impact of Latinx communities in Washington County. Um, and in that presentation, I really want to look at, at some kind of contemporary figures uh, to understand the really profound uh, impact that Latinx communities are, are having here in Oregon. I, I want to stop and sh the, the share for just a second um, and, and ask uh, Christina if, if we want to take questions at the very end or whether we want to um, answer the questions as they sort of come up. I, I did not see Jose's hand up, but if we could wait um, for questions at the end, if folks have pressing questions, please use the Q&A feature and we'll track questions that way. Um, and Mr. Pastrana can also see those in the event that's something that he's covering in future um, slides. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Christina. Excellent. I'll come back to, to sharing my screen. All right, so, so that's kind of the, the roadmap, the plan for uh, these five sessions. Uh, and, and as we engage in this history, um, you know, I've thought through some, some outcomes that I want to share with you all, um, kind of goals, very aspirational goals that I have for um, what will be a, a lot of time together, right? I mean, sort of collectively between these five sessions, we're going to be spending five, six, seven hours together. And so um, I think it's important for us to have some kind of goals or, or outcomes in mind for this work that we're doing together. Um, and so uh, I, I've identified three. I'll, I'll share them here. Um, first, uh, I hope that we together can describe the historical experiences of Latinx people in the United States. Um, and with an emphasis on community development here in Oregon uh, and specifically in Washington County. I'm also hoping that through this learning series, we're able to explore some of the global dynamics uh, that connect economic development in Latin America with immigration to the United States. Right? These two themes are very intimately connected. It's important that we talk about them. 
Uh, and then finally, uh, I hope that we leave this series with a better understanding of the contemporary experiences of Latinx communities uh, in Oregon, uh, as well as their contributions, their economic, political, social contributions, and cultural contributions, excuse me, to Washington County. And so those are very big goals. Those are aspirational. Um, and, and, you know, the history that we'll be covering in some of these sessions uh, is going to be very specific. Um, but I think that when we pull back after our time together, that hopefully we will have covered these topics and that you all will feel um, you know, more confident, not just in, in, in talking about Latinx history, but also in thinking about how this history is, is in very real ways shaping and continuing to shape the lives of Latinx communities in Washington County. So uh, I've already used a whole bunch of different words uh, uh, to describe uh, the people that we'll be talking about in this learning series. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to talk a little bit about ethnic identity uh, and the terminology that we use to describe uh, um, Latinx, Hispanic, people. It's, uh, and, and so I want to share with you all this really, I think, powerful statement um, that was crafted by uh, representatives of the Oregon Higher Education Coordinating Commission. And this is part of a statement that was um, issued uh, during Hispanic Heritage Month uh, this past year. Uh, and, and it reads, we start by recognizing the variations in our identity and how we name our community. While we may share traditions, languages, regions, and history, our identities are varied and beautiful. It is important that we give individual attention to each of these designations, as it reminds us that we all walk through the world differently. Centering equity in our lives means we move past generalizations and see the individual spirit within a community. And then they encourage us to take a moment to explore various uh, or numerous identities within the Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Latinx, Latine community uh, and their evolving terminology. Um, and so um, I don't want to take a lot of space uh, in walking us through um, all of the various definitions and the history uh, that is, is uh, uh, packed into these very complicated terms. Um, but I, I do think it's important to sort of establish some kind of baseline definitions for, for these terms uh, and, and how we'll be using them differently uh, throughout the, the presentations that, that we'll be sharing. I also want to say that that um, identity is complex, and we often do hold uh, multiple identities uh, uh, at the same time. And so, and these are not mutually exclusive, nor um, are these uh, you know definitions that are set in stone. They're just ones that I think work really well uh, in a single slide. So here we are, Hispanic. When I'm talking about someone who is Hispanic, I'm talking about folks who are native of or descend from a Spanish speaking country. Uh, and so for the purposes of this presentation, I'm gonna be talking a lot about folks who descend from Spain, uh, who are also Hispanic. Um, Chicano, Chicana uh, is first and foremost a chosen or a political identity. Most often we associate this with someone who is native of or descends from Mexico and who lives in the United States, but not exclusively. I've got plenty of friends and colleagues that are not from Mexico and who nonetheless identify as Chicano or Chicana. Latino or Latina, someone who is native of or descends from a Latin American country. And then finally, and then, excuse me, uh, so Latino, Latina would include Brazilian uh, folks, but it would not include Spanish folks. Uh, and then finally, Latinx, Latine, uh, which are both gender neutral terms uh, to refer to someone who is native of or descends from uh, a Latin American country. And um, I, I know that these terms are very um, loaded and, and that we have a lot of, um, um, we might have a lot of questions about kind of where these terms originate from or, or which are most appropriate to use uh, in a specific context. And so if you all have questions about that, that's something that I'm happy to engage with in that discussion uh, at the conclusion of our, of our talk. Uh, but like I said, I really wanna focus cause you know, I wanna engage in this history chronologically. I'm a historian, I can't avoid doing that. Uh, I wanna start with thinking about 
the Hispanic presence in Oregon and the, the origins, or, or maybe let's call them the roots of the Hispanic presence in Oregon. Uh, and so I, I wanna share these two quotations uh, to help us kind of frame our conversation or the way that we should think about this early Hispanic presence in Oregon. And the first quotation comes from Lynn Steven and Marcela Mendoza, who write that any discussion of Latinos in Oregon has to begin with a larger discussion of Spanish colonialism, the emergence of independent Mexico, and the imperial expansion of the United States. It's really important. So today we're going to talk quite a bit about Spanish colonialism, uh, um, and we're going to certainly talk about the consequences of, of an independent Mexico uh, and imperial expansion of the United States. So that's those kind of the big topics that I want to grapple with today. Uh, I also then want to share this quotation from David Lewis, uh, a, a local uh, indigenous scholar uh, who writes um, in the epilogue uh, to a book on the origins of Hispanics in uh, Oregon, quote, the Spanish sailors were the first Europeans to visit many tribes on the coast. And it is important to understand this story so that the next generation of native scholars can research the native experience during Spanish exploration. This next part is really important to me. This history will be every bit as terrible and heartbreaking as those histories of other colonizers, but necessary to fully tell the history and context of human interactions during first contacts on the Pacific coast. The, the reason that I say that this is important to me is because the, the early history of the Latino presence in Oregon, whether we're talking about Hispanic folks folks descended from Spain or early Mexicans, right? We're talking about a history where folks are contributing in variety of ways to the colonization of native peoples in the Pacific Northwest, right? Uh, and so I'll share some specific examples in a bit, right? But but I, I want to kind of complicate, this is a really complicated idea, right? And I think it's it's an important one and worthwhile to hold on to, right? Um, that there has long been a Hispanic presence in Oregon. And at the same time, that that Hispanic presence has defined itself in opposition to indigenous peoples, right? So we, we should hold that contradiction. We should think about, right, this heartbreaking, history uh, that, that Dr. Lewis implores us to think about as we engage and we reflect on this early uh, Hispanic presence. And so uh, I want to share now a kind of timeline of what I think are some, some really significant events um, in this early history and some that you know, we'll talk about in a little bit greater depth. This timeline of the his early Hispanic presence in Oregon that I'm sharing here is adapted from Latino Roots in Lane County, which is a really wonderful publication uh, created by Lynn Stevens and her colleagues and students at the University of Oregon. Uh, and I want to highlight, um, you know, I'll go through these events in order, um, and some of them, you know, we'll talk in, in a little bit more depth about. Uh, but in 1513, Balboa Vasquez de Nunez, representing the Spanish Empire, lays claim to the Pacific Ocean and all of the land that it touches. Think about that date, 1513. That's about 100 years, just a little bit under 100 years before the founding of Jamestown. 1513 is before, the, before Cortez um, conquers the Aztec Empire, 1520. Right. So early on, we're already thinking about um, how Hispanic people are shaping, are going to be influencing the history of um, the entire Pacific Ocean. Uh, but by the 1700s, uh, Spanish explorers are beginning to uh, move beyond California and starting to explore the coast of what is today the Pacific Northwest, what we call today the Pacific Northwest, uh, and that includes Oregon. And so in 1774, Juan Perez is likely the first European to set foot in Oregon. Again, consider the dates, 1774. 
This is before the American Revolution has really started, right? So before George Washington and the revolution, before the Declaration of Independence, already there are Hispanic people uh, uh, presence uh, in, in Oregon. In 1819, uh, the United States and Spain signed the Adam Onis Treaty, which is also known as the Tricontinental Treaty. It transfers to the United States all Spanish claims north of the 42nd parallel, which is the modern border between California and Oregon. This treaty has a lot of implications for Latinos in the United States. One of the other consequences is that it hands over possession of uh, Spanish Florida to the United States. Right? Um, in 1821, Mexico will become an independent country. And when it does so, Oregon, the Oregon Territory's southern border will become the territorial boundary of the border between the United States and Mexico. And that's interesting to think about, right? And that driven past the California-Oregon border many times, right? And so imagine the, uh, an alternate possibility, an alternate vision of history where that is the territorial boundary between Mexico and the United States. The reason it's not, of course, is because of the Mexican-American War, which ends in 1848. Uh, the treaty that ends that war is called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and it calls for Mexico to give up more than half of its territory, including what become the states of California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, parts of Colorado, Nevada, and Utah. And so whereas Oregon had once bordered uh, Mexico, now it borders uh, a soon-to-be state, right? California becomes a state in 1850. Shortly thereafter, we start to see Mexican mule packers move beyond Northern California and into Southern Oregon as part of uh, the shift in gold mining. Uh, and and you know, I'll talk about this more in just a minute, but, but these Mexican mule packers are very skilled uh, at a really important task. Uh, and, and their presence and their labor is very valued, um, not just in California, but throughout the Pacific Northwest. And yet at the same time, and you know, this makes me think back to that quotation from Dr. Lewis, right? Mexicans packing these mules are supplying uh, uh, volunteers who are uh, fighting uh, a war to take land away from native peoples. And so it's interesting then to think about, you know, that is a contribution, an early contribution of Mexican people to this region. And then the last little bit of history that I want to touch on today uh, is, is the presence of Mexican vaqueros, which really starts around 1869, 1870, as we start to see uh, Mexicans accompany California cattlemen who are shifting their operations from California to Eastern Oregon. Uh, and I'll share um, some, some very compelling photographs of some of these early Mexican vaqueros who settle in, in Harney and, and uh, in Malheur County in Eastern Oregon. But I'm, I'm fascinated by the story of Juan Perez. Juan Perez in 1774, uh, is charged with exploring the Pacific Northwest, which the Spanish call Nueva Galica. And you can see that here in this page from his diary. This is a continuation of the diary of Juan Perez, uh, who is the pilot of the Department of San Blas. And he pilots a ship called the Santiago, uh, and he is headed towards Nueva Galica, right, where he is going to explore this coast. And you can see the date here is 1774. Again, consider that in relation to what we understand about you know, key dates in American history, 1776 and the starting of the American Revolution. Juan Perez is not alone on this journey. Uh, he has a crew uh, and it's very likely that that crew includes not just other Hispanics like Juan Perez, but also by 1774, likely includes folks that we would describe today as mestizos, right? Folks biracial who are both of Spanish and indigenous descent. 
And so I think it's really compelling to imagine, right, that the first people who are exploring uh, the coast of Oregon, the first Europeans, excuse me, uh, who are exploring the coast of Oregon and interacting with indigenous peoples are, are Hispanics, right, this guy Juan Perez, uh, but also, um, you know, people who we would think of as Mexican, right, uh, you know, who, who are accompanying Juan on this journey. Uh, and so, you know, uh, Juan uh, is, is, you know, exploring this region uh, on behalf of Spain, uh, and the reason for doing so is because he wants to establish the territorial claim of the Spanish Empire over this region. Uh, and so how do you do that? How, how do you, how do you, you know, in, in 1774, how do you establish that, that you have uh, you know, uh, first dibs in the language of colonization uh, over this land belonging to indigenous peoples. Um, well, maps play a really important role in that history of colonization uh, because they serve as proof uh, or, or some form of evidence, right, that can be used uh, to argue that that we explored this first, that we the Spanish, right, talking about uh, you know the, the the British, and that's exactly what's happening here, right? The British and the Spanish are both competing over uh, what is today British Columbia, right? You can see who wins; it's the British, right? Uh, but these maps uh, and and the journey of Perez are part of. Um, the the Spanish Empire trying to establish itself as a presence in the Pacific Northwest and in this region. There's there's one more interesting story that that I'll tell about Juan Perez uh, when he and his crew arrive uh, off of uh, the coast of Victoria Island, right? So so now north uh, and and into Canada, what is today Canada. Um, they trade with a, a local indigenous tribe, uh, and and a few years later, um, Captain James Cook, a sort of British, uh, uh, famous British explorer, arrives in in basically the same location, uh, and and when he does, uh, his crew uh, encounters an indigenous person who's wearing a necklace uh, that has on it two spoons. Uh, and, and these spoons allegedly had been either left behind or possibly stolen from Juan Perez, uh, and, and thus were evidence, right, like legal evidence that could be used and that was used uh, by the Spanish Empire to prove uh, that they had been the first to explore uh, this region. And so I'm, I find this history fascinating. It's not something that, that I was at all familiar with, but it is really interesting, I think, to think about this early, this early Hispanic presence in, in Oregon. Um, but of course, this is all about making claims on land that, that, is not, that, that folks are not yet interested in settling. Uh, and so um, there is a, a different phase of uh, what we could think of as the Hispanic or the Mexican presence in Oregon and in the Pacific Northwest that starts with um, not just Mexico becoming an independent country in 1821, but also with the Mexican-American War in 1846, uh, ending in 1848. Uh, and so I, I want to talk a little bit about that very important event. Uh, and I also want to think about like the consequences it might have held for people here in Oregon. I mentioned earlier that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, calls for Mexico to hand over uh, uh, about half of its territory to the United States. Uh, and so you can see on these two maps uh, created just a year apart, right, how uh, the boundaries of Mexico are changing as a result of the Mexican-American War uh, and the loss of, of this territory. You can also see the implications that this holds for Oregon, right? On the map on the left, you can see over here the boundary between Oregon. Uh, the border here is the border between Oregon territory and uh, Mexico, right? The, the Mexican state of Alta California, which stretches all the way up to that 42nd parallel. A year later, boundaries have been entirely redrawn, right? And now that boundary uh, is not between Oregon and Mexico, but instead between Oregon and what will soon become 
uh, uh, the newest state in the Union by 1850, California. And so think about what this means for the people that are living in territory that yesterday was Mexico and that today is now part of the United States. Because really, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo meant that at the stroke of a pen, about 100,000 people of Mexican descent who had been living north of this new border, all of a sudden will find themselves strangers in a foreign land, right? And the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo contemplates kind of what's going to happen to these people, many of them in places like Los Angeles or Santa Barbara, who mm, before the war had been Mexican citizens living in Mexico, uh, and now uh, are, are um, in an entirely new status uh, in an entirely new country. Uh, and so the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which not only settled these territorial claims, also addresses a really important point in Mexican-American history, uh, which is the question of citizenship. The treaty itself is very long and, and it's very detailed. It has a lot of uh, clauses that are about um, uh, building uh, uh, lines of connection between the two countries, railroads, roads, um, uh, uh, um, other opportunities for binational trade. Um, but it, the, the treaty itself says very little about immigration. In fact, it says nothing about immigration. Um, and, and these two articles um, are the ones that establish or that answer this question of what is going to happen to Mexicans who are now founding, finding themselves in the United States. And so let, let's think about, you know, first article nine, uh, eight, eight, excuse me, on the left-hand side. Mexicans now established in territories previously belonging to Mexico and which shall remain in the future within the United States shall be free to continue where they now reside or to remove at any time to the Mexican Republic. Those who shall prefer to remain in said territories may either retain the titles and rights of Mexican citizens or acquire those of citizens in the United States. This is really powerful. Right. This article says that Mexicans who are in the United States can remain in the United States as Mexican citizens, or they can elect to become American citizens. And actually, the part that I erased here sp spells out that Mexicans actually don't have to do anything for this to happen. Automatically, after a year, Mexicans who do not make this choice will be automatically assumed to be American citizens. Now, Article 9 uh, adds to that, Mexicans who in the territories aforesaid shall not preserve the character of citizens of the Mexican Republic, that is to say those who choose to become American citizens, shall be incorporated into the Union of the United States and be admitted at a proper time to be judged by the Congress of the United States to the enjoyment of all rights of citizens of the United States. And so this second article, is saying not only are Mexicans citizens, but that eventually this territory that used to be Mexico will be admitted into the Union as states on an equal basis as those other states that already existed. Right? This is really profound to think about what this means for the future of Mexican people after 1848. For one, it means the Mexican people will have the right of naturalization. They can become US citizens, right? At a time when citizenship is determined by a piece of legislation that had been passed in 1790, which is known as the Naturalization Act. The Naturalization Act had said that only free white people could become citizens. So stay with me. Mexicans are allowed to be citizens and only free white people are able to be citizens. Therefore, Mexicans are white people, legally speaking. 
right? From the perspective of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Now, will Mexicans receive treatment as white folks, either by the law or by uh, vigilantes? That's a totally different question, right? But at least by the letter of the law, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexicans are eligible for citizenship at a time when citizenship is the exclusive right of free white citizens. So what does this mean for people in Oregon? Two years after the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, historians have identified the very first person of Mexican descent that is named in a census document here in Oregon. This is pretty mind blowing, at least it was for me as a historian who really geeks out about this stuff. This is a census document from 1850 showing a bunch of stuff. Let's walk through it. First of all, this document records free inhabitants. That is to say, it's before the end of slavery. So there would have been a different document that would have counted enslaved inhabitants, right? Of course, that doesn't apply to Oregon because Oregon is still as a territory in 1850, operating under exclusion laws that banned black folks from entering the state and settling in the state. Keep that in mind because it'll come back in a second. This is a census track for Oregon City in the county of Clackamas. You can see the word state has been crossed out and instead territory of Oregon. Oregon does not become a state until 1858, but it's already being, uh, the a census is already being taken as early as 1850. But what I want to highlight here is the yellow down below, uh, which lists a Guadalupe, and the spelling here is French, de la Croix, but we know what they meant, Guadalupe de la Cruz, right, who in 1850 was 13 years old. This is a 13-year-old boy, Guadalupe de la Cruz, who was born in Mexico and was, at least according to the census document, attending school in Oregon City in the county of Clackamas. That's mind blowing, right? Eight years before Oregon is a state, right? There's already people of Mexican descent showing up on the census documents uh, in Oregon. It's also fascinating to think of like, who is this person? Where do they come from, right? Uh, where, where, how did Guadalupe de la Cruz, who was born in Mexico, um, make his way to Oregon City? One suspicion that I have uh, is that, that Guadalupe was adopted. Um, and and uh, other historians have, have described this possibility as well. The name listed right below him uh, is Anson Dart. Uh, and you can see the notation here reads that he was the superintendent of Indian affairs. Anson Dart had been sent from Washington DC to negotiate a treaty with um, the Kalapuya people, um, which he ultimately fails in doing so. The treaty, the Willamette Valley Treaty that's described in the land acknowledgement for Washington County was the treaty that Anson Dart had been sent to try to negotiate, but ultimately failed and was relieved of his duty for. But so, so this is fascinating for me to think about, like, who was this person? What was their life like, right? What, you know, what was, how did this 13 year old boy find themselves in this situation? Uh, and then what happens next, right? Like we, we don't have any record of this person in the census after this. Um, and so um, I, I wish that I had more details, but I think that there's something really powerful in the mystery of not knowing more about this person. Um, what we do know, though, um, is that uh, they were born likely, um, you know, uh, that they could have born, been born, excuse me, um, in Mexico, that is a part of Mexico that was now the United States. Right. Uh, and, and the reason why I think that might make sense is because there is no um, mark under his race, or as it's written here, color. And so the census rules around 1850 would have indicated that this space would have been left blank if the respondent, if the person being sense, uh, being counted uh, was a white person. So fascinating story about Guadalupe de la Cruz, uh, and, and I wish I, I knew more, um, but in the 1850s, Mexicans are starting to show up to Oregon. Um, some of them, like I mentioned earlier, are quite skilled 
um, including those Mexicans that move from Northern California to Oregon uh, to participate in to 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 share to to share their skills as mule packers, right? Uh, and so Erasmo Gamboa, who is the historian referenced in the letter at the beginning of this presentation, writes this about them. Despite a sprinkling of Anglo mule packers in Oregon, the Mexican packers were clearly dominant in their trade. This superiority stemmed from a centuries-long experience with mule packing throughout the Southwest in Mexico. When the mining frontier moved north from California to Southern Oregon in 1851, Mexicans were the first to bring loaded pack trains across the Siskiyou Mountains and into the areas of the Rogue River. This is really powerful, I think, and, and I really uh, uh, sort of I'm filled with pride uh, at the dignity of work um, that that went into Mexican mule packing. Uh, and yet, I'm also reminded uh, that part of this work uh, was in support of uh, colonization. Uh, and and in particular, in support of uh, the 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 removal of indigenous peoples from uh, the Willamette Valley, from Southern Oregon, uh, in in the Rogue River Wars of 1855, which again Mexicans would have played a role in. They they would have you know been part of the supply, or they would have supplied, excuse me, uh, the volunteers. Uh, who were, um, you know, engaged in in, in warfare and, and and frankly genocide uh, against indigenous peoples. Mule packers had a particular skill at a moment when that skill was desperately needed. 1850 was before the termination, the, the construction of railroads, which would have connected major parts of the interior of the United States, including the Pacific Northwest. And so there's a, a kind of deadline on the work that Mexicans are doing uh, here because their labor is ultimately going to be replaced uh, by technology, right? And, and that technology being trains. Uh, another skilled job that Mexicans do early on in Oregon that is ultimately replaced by technology is uh, the work of being cowboys. Mexicans. Uh, accompanied uh, California cattlemen when they shifted their operations from California to Eastern Oregon, uh, beginning in the late 1860s, but really into the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, you know, some of the first uh, cattle farm or ranchers uh, in Malheur uh, or Harney County uh, brought with them uh, their trusted Mexican vaqueros. Um, and and these photographs, um, which you know come from the Harney County Library, uh, are are um, you know some of these folks uh, who you know made their presence uh, felt here in Oregon uh, by bringing with them this very valuable skill of of uh, you know moving of transporting cattle uh, very large long distances. Um, you know, and again, the fact that there are not yet uh, railroad networks in the Pacific Northwest is part of what necessitates uh, the labor uh, the Mexicans are doing. And, and, you know, there's a whole kind of subculture that grows out of Mexican vaqueros uh, that lives on in, you know, uh, uh, the kind of Wild West um, sort of mystique. Uh, this idea of, you know, buckaroos. Uh, a buckaroo is, is a different way of pronouncing the Mexican word vaquero or, or cowboys. There's a lot of, of borrowing, cultural borrowing between cowboy culture and, and Mexican and, and Spanish and even to some extent Moorish uh, culture uh, around horsemanship. But uh, these photographs, I think, are really, really powerful. Right, they speak to the presence of Mexican people uh, in Oregon uh, in the seventh in Eastern Oregon in the 17, 1870s, excuse me, uh, and eighteen eighties. I'm, I'm really drawn to the story of the man on the left hand side, uh, Rafael Chapo Bermudez, uh, and you know, uh, I once again sort of dove into the census records to see what I could find uh, about this individual um, who uh, you know has. Uh, a really interesting story, uh, some of which we can read from these census documents. For instance, uh, you know, this uh, census count, which was made in 1900, right, indicates that Rafael Bermudez 
who was the head of household, married to a woman named Florence. Um, he was uh, um, he was potentially marked as black, which I think is fascinating, right? Um, keep in mind, um, Oregon's black exclusion laws are on the books until 1920, 19, 18, 1926, excuse me. Um, and so you can see, maybe you can see, I hope you can see, that the marking here on his color or race is different than those above and below him, which are very clearly Ws, right? Uh, and that seems to be a mark that indicates B for black. Right? Of course, because he was a Mexican citizen or because he was a Mexican who potentially had been naturalized in the United States, uh, his race legally should have been white. So it's interesting to me that he's marked in this way. Anyways, we know that Rafael's parents were born in Mexico. This document indicates that he first enters the United States in 1878, and that he had lived in the United States for 22 years. He was a stock raiser. He owned a, a farm. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, just remarkable to think about, you know, this, this individual, Rafael Bermudez, uh, you know, doing this, this work. Um, in, in Harney County in, eight, in, in 1900. And actually, uh, his story is even more interesting than this because um, he also applies for and receives uh, not one, but two homesteads, uh, which theoretically should be legal. Uh, people were only allowed to have one homestead. Uh, but because of the confusion around his name and his identity and his place of birth, uh, he is able to successfully petition uh, for two uh, pretty sizable homesteads, including one that is 160 acres uh, in, in there in Harney County, uh, where he dies in, in 1926, um, uh, depending on who you ask, at the age of 80 uh, or potentially a little bit younger. I'm going to start to kind of wrap things up here and leave some space for some questions. I have just a handful more slides that I want to share with you all. Um, but, you know, I, I mentioned that both these vaqueros uh, and these Mexican mule packers that are some of the first uh, to, to come into the Pacific Northwest and to Oregon specifically after the, the Mexican independence and the, the Mexican-American War, their labor is ultimately made uh, uh, um, expendable by changes in technology and in globalization. Uh, and so I, I want to end just by asking us to think about, and this is really a way of anticipating what's coming next, um, the really important role that the railroads play um, in connecting the interior of Mexico uh, with um, not just the American Southwest, but really all of the United States. Uh, this photograph here on the right is of Mexican track workers, not in the Pacific Northwest, but rather in the Midwest in Chicago, where they worked in close proximity uh, with Greek migrants. Uh, and there's a theory that potentially this is where the word gringo comes from, as Mexican track workers uh, you know, uh, worked in close proximity with Greek immigrants and, and Greeks or griegos is very close to gringos. And so there's a, a persuasive theory that maybe that's where the origins of that word comes from. But the railroads certainly help to explain the origins of Latino, Latinx, especially Mexican communities far outside of the American Southwest. Uh, and so the railroad brings Mexican people into Portland, uh, into the Pacific Northwest, uh, at the same time that it makes obsolete that kind of skilled labor that people like Rafael Chapo Bermudez and others had been doing in Oregon for generations. Uh, and so when we meet again, uh, the story that I will tell will be about the Bracero program, uh, which operates here in Oregon from 1942 to 1946, but that really lays the groundwork uh, for um, the, the kind of contemporary uh, uh, Latinx communities uh, that really start to flourish uh, in, in the 1970s. Uh, as um, American immigration policies begin to change. Um, and so we'll talk about railroads, we'll talk about agriculture, we'll talk about farm work, um, we'll talk about how Mexicans are received in these communities. Think of a town like Independence, Oregon, where in 1942, 
500 young Mexican men between the ages of 18 and 22 would have just been dropped off. Right. And, and this moment of the Bracero program and really the kind of um, uh, the, the encounter between Mexican farm workers uh, and, and, and white folks uh, here in Oregon really kind of sets the tone for the future of ethnic and race relations between these two groups moving forward. So that's something that I'll, I'll want to reflect on the next time we meet. Um, the other thing I want to, you know, kind of end with and, and also spend some time reflecting on the next time we meet is the legacy of all of this history, right? It's important to acknowledge it, it's important to hold it, but it's also important to think about how that history shapes the present. Um, and so I, I have, you know, these two photographs here, the first of a, a very large mural in Vail, Oregon, which is in Malheur County, created by Colleen Mitchell Vena, titled Vaqueros. Uh, and I, I think about that, I, I, that, that this beautiful, beautiful mural um, and this very dignified photograph of Chapo Bermudez. And I, I can't prove to you that this is the model that was used, um, but I, I do think that they, the two share a lot in common uh, and, and you know, may have in myriad ways uh, been the inspiration for uh, this particular mural. Um, and then finally, and, and kind of as a, you know, taste of what's to come, uh, here's this really beautiful photograph from the Oregon Historical Society of one of the first uh, fiesta days that was celebrated in Woodburn, Oregon uh, in 1966. Uh, and I love this photograph of uh, this little boy and he's, you know, he's holding his ribbon uh, and he's sitting very precariously on the hood of, of what looks like a very nice uh, car. Uh, and you can see maybe here a very worried mom kind of poking her head out the window just to make sure that her son is all right. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful photograph. Um, that, that shows uh, us in a very dignified way, um, but that also stands as a reminder that, you know, when Mexican people in 1966 were dressing up as, as charros and as, horse, uh, uh, as horsemen, you know, they, they weren't solely bringing with them their culture from their place of origin. They were also reenacting a history that was part of this community. Uh, or, or at least part of, of, you know, the Latino presence, the Hispanic presence in Oregon, which I think is, is really beautiful. Um, and, you know, um, yeah, so very kind of last, last things. Um, I want to end with this uh, quotation from Jaime Arredondo, uh, a local community activist, uh, somebody who's very active, especially in, in Salem uh, and, and in Woodburn. Um, and, you know, uh, he, he wrote this as part of the prologue to the same book that I shared the quotation from uh, Dr. David Lewis. Um, and, and this is from the prologue of that book. He writes, the profound indigenous root of Mexico makes it possible to venture that migration to the Pacific Northwest coming from Mexican towns are, from a deep history perspective, a return. Let's just remember that one of the largest branches of Oregon's Native American languages comes from the vast Uto Aztec linguistic family, which extends from the Pacific Northwest to Central America. Thus, from colonial times on, the Mexican presence has been a constant in the territory of Oregon. I think that's a really powerful quotation. Um, that, that I think is also a really sort of apt way of thinking about the connections between um, Latinx communities uh, and indigenous or Native American communities. And again, you know, we started by acknowledging that, that today is the last day of, of Native American and, and Alaska Native Heritage Month. Um, and I think that these kinds of questions uh, are, are really generative um, and get us to think about um, uh, identity uh, and indigeneity in ways that that really reject colonial borders that were imposed on these communities. Um, and then, you know, I want to open it up now to questions and, and, and answers. Um, I'm happy to hear your thoughts, your reflections. Um, you, you're welcome to, you know, if, if you've got some a statement that you want to make, uh, I'm happy to hear it. Um, but I want to leave you all with just a couple of questions uh, to think about, to reflect on, and, and potentially, you know, to, to hold for future action. Um, and, and these are, you know, questions that are drawn from some of what I've been sort of talking about over the last, what now, hour and change 
Um, first, you know, and I shared my positionality. I'm, I'm curious, what's yours? What's your positionality and, and, and how do your social identities intersect with the work that you do for Washington County? Secondly, uh, how does this knowledge that I've shared with you all about the early Hispanic presence in Oregon challenge our understanding of the state's history? And I, I ask you to think about this from the perspective maybe of a, a young Latinx student uh, who might feel like an outsider in this place to learn about this history. Um, and then finally, uh, how can we apply our knowledge of this history uh, to better serve Latinx communities in Oregon and Washington County? I mean, after all, that is why we are here, right? You all are engaged in this work. Um, you all are experiencing the very rapid demographic transformation that I want to share some of the sort of deeper history around. Um, but ultimately, there should be some value around this history and what you can do with it and, and how you can use it to, to better serve uh, Latinx communities here in, in our state and in, in your service area. So I'll stop the share screen now and I see a couple question and answers coming in maybe. Um, but um, yeah, thank you all so, so much for um, sticking with me and for not giving me any updates about the soccer game, which is great because that means I can go watch it on the recording downstairs in, in a little while, y'all. Well, thank you so much, Israel. I will not share the score of the soccer game um, so that you have the ability to, to watch that in the recording. But we do have a couple questions in the chat. The first question is if these if this PowerPoint, these slides will be available, um, be made available to folks. I'm happy to make them available. And Christina, I will send them to you right after um, uh, this presentation. Um, and if you have any questions about the underlying research um, from the presentation, you know, and many of the photographs have citations, but if there's any questions about like where this is coming from, I'm, I'm happy to engage in, in, in that conversation. Great, and we'll upload those on the uh, culture celebration page that's available to all our staff through Horizons. And then also, um, there's a question about, um, do you have suggested reading lists you can share? And just an appreciation of your presentation. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I would love to share um, a reading list. And, you know, uh, there's lots of, of, you know, really powerful ways of engaging with this history. Um, when, when I was a young person who was doing very poorly in high school, um, one of the things that I found really impactful was to read um, literature and fiction uh, uh, about um, the, you know, uh, Mexican immigration to the United States. I wrote, read a wonderful book um, called uh, Reign of Gold. I actually talked about it the last time that I was with you all. Um, Reign of Gold was a New York Times bestseller in the 1990s, um, written by Victor Villaseñor. That is my uncle, it turns out. And, and one of the characters in that story is Victoriano, who I told you about in this presentation. And so, um, yeah, that, that might be a great sort of, if you want to learn a little bit more about that history, the book is called Reign of Gold. Um, the author is Victor Villaseñor. But I've got a ton of reading recommendations um, and, and, and things to listen to, podcasts, documentaries to watch, right? It doesn't just have to be reading um, that you can engage with to learn more about this history. Thank you for that. Yeah, anything you want to share that I can share with our staff would be greatly appreciated. We do have a, um, a section in our um, county webpage that, in our internet that allows staff to um, utilize resources that are recommended by some of our speakers and others. So thank you. So I want to turn it over to anyone. If you have any questions, you can, um, if you would like to ask your question, you may use a raise hand feature um, or you may type them in the Q&A. So I'll just give a bit of um, space of silence for folks to either type their question or um, use a raise hand feature. All right, seeing none. Um, thank you so much as well. I'm not sure if you um, have additional questions for us. I know that you had some slides up with some questions that you wanted us to reflect on. Um, I don't know if you can put those in the chat or you can email them to me and I can add them to the recording of, um, of this presentation for folks to have, you know, 
some consideration and maybe the next um, series would be a bit more thought um, and processing of information. Uh, we do have um, some comments in the uh, Q&A chat, you know, thanking folks for um, the presentation and having this put together. But I do really appreciate um, the, the beginning of this learning series and the foundational work that you have provided for us. Um, Israel, you know, as uh, as a Latina uh, woman in, in the community working in public service, it's very important for me to understand history and, and being a native Oregonian um, and not recognizing um, the deep roots of history that our ancestors have in community is really important to learn as how we um, are able to, um, you know, consider where we've been, consider where we're at, and then how we're moving forward together to where we're going. So thank you so much. I appreciate you saying that, Christina. And, and you know, um, I, I didn't grow up in this community. I, you know, I, I come from Southern California and I moved here in 2016 and I, I knew none of this, I, none of this history was, was something that had ever, you know, and I, I'm somebody who studied Chicano history. Uh, you know, I, I did doctoral coursework in, in this field um, and never really learned about this very rich and powerful history of Latinos in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and now that I'm here, uh, I really feel a kind of sense of obligation, right? That if I'm going to be a part of this community, and I certainly intend to for the rest of my life, right? That, you know, I, I want to learn more about the folks. And, you know, I think of Jose Angel Gutierrez, you know, who I referenced earlier, who have been doing this, had been doing this work for so long um, and, and the value of it. So I, yeah, thank you so much for that. And happy to share these questions, right? When I share the slides. And again, we will have multiple opportunities to engage. And so um, if there are questions that you all want to bring with you the next time that we meet. Um, you know, I'd be happy to reflect on those as well. Um, but sí, muchas gracias. Yeah, and the other thing um, that I found quite interesting and just reflecting on what you shared today was, I'm not sure if many folks know that there was a Chicano University in Oregon, in Mi Angel, Colegio Cesar Chavez, um, that was open for a period of time and had several graduates. And I believe it's coming up to, um, obviously the school's closed now, but it's around the time it was like 50 or 60 year kind of recognition of that um, university, that colegio in Mount Angel. So. Yeah, Colegio Cesar Chavez is a really fascinating story, right? They they start in 73, they close their doors in 83. So they're around for about 10 years. And during that time, and since then, they are and have been the only Chicano owned four year college in the United States. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I've been sharing presentations recently, you know, with institutions that are or are close to becoming Hispanic serving institutions, uh, higher education. Um, and, and it's fascinating to think about how much of the work that we're doing today is building on the models that were created in the 1970s and 1980s by folks doing this work at Colegio Cesar Chavez. I mean, even some of the people that I referenced during this presentation, Jose Angel Gutierrez, uh, Consuelo Zaragoza, they also have connections to, to that space. And so, um, uh, Cristina, I, I promise that one of our whole sessions will be about um, Colegio Cesar Chavez, the Chicano movement, the intersection between the Chicano movement and the farm worker movement here. Um, yeah, that's definitely something that is, is kind of on the horizon. Um, but the, the sort of understanding the value of that history, I think, is definitely something that sort of comes back to um, places like Colegio Cesar Chavez, which teach us the value value of, you know, knowing our heritage and really cherishing it. Well, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to add some time and space for folks who may have a question, a comment. Um, again, you may use the raise hand features or use the Q&A box. Um, and if not, then, oh, let's see, then we can get wrapped up. Um, just uh, thank you, uh, Israel and Christine. This was informative. They look forward to the next sessions. Muchas gracias. Um, and folks are hoping, looking forward to learning more. So with that being said, uh, we will wrap up this uh, first uh, series of, of our lecture series. Um, so thank you so much, Israel, for your time. Um, thank you all for being here on a Wednesday and for sharing time with me in space on a Wednesday morning and, and, and afternoon, y'all. All right. Well, muchas gracias. And I'm going to end the recording. Um,